Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please welcome to the stage the president and founder of SCAD, Paula Wallace. Thank you. It is my honor to introduce Will I Am's fashion guru, the Valentino clad avatar in Kim Kardashian's mobile game, the man Manolo Blahnik, equated with fashion itself, and SCAD's patron saint of style, Andre Leon Towey. Fifteen years ago, Andre earned SCAD's first Lifetime Achievement Award, an award it seemed only fitting to rename in his honor. On this very stage, fashion icons including Musha Prada, Tom Ford, Vera Wang, Mark Jacobs, and Diane von Furstenberg have won the Andre Leon Talley Lifetime Achievement Award. And tonight, we honor another fashion visionary, Vivian Westwood. A year after winning the award himself, Andre presented it to his colleague and friend, Oscar De La Renta, precipitating a deep and lasting friendship between Oscar and SCAD. Things never happen by accident, Oscar once said. They happen because you have a vision, you have a commitment, you have a dream. Andre is an exemplar of Oscar's sage words. During Andre's childhood in Durham, North Carolina, Andre's grandmother encouraged his love of fashion and desire to make his mark. Emboldened by her belief and propelled by his immense talent and intentional work, he rose from an assistant to the legendary Diane of Vreeland to the editor-at-large of Vogue, the magazine he'd read since boyhood. He is a Renaissance man and a tastemaker, the beacon that illumines Scad's ascent to the apex of fashion education. Andre's influence is ubiquitous. His name adorns a gallery at the Scad Museum of Art, and he has curated many Scad exhibitions over the years. He's helped Scad to become the top talent source for fashion titans, including Alexander Wang, Calvin Klein, Donna Karen, and Zach Posen. And he continues to bring fashion cognoscenti and revolutionary designers, Viva Vivian Westwood, to SCAD. Please join me in welcoming my very dear friend, writer, historian, and couture chronicler, Andre Leon Talley. And paper, paper, paper. Whoa! You look lovely. Oh, you look fabulous. What is my role as a day today? We have a dialogue about fashion. Women's emancipation turned fashion around. Rip it up! You can also go to a designer like Ralph Rucci. I'm here with the fabulous getting clothes. Hello, Scott. Oh, hello, Scott. You are curating an Oscar de la Renta exhibit form. Magnificent. Fascinating. You have such an eye. My eyes are starving. What do you think? Luxury or nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Andre Leon Talley. Woo! Woo! Woo thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So excited to be here. This is one of the great evenings for SCAD. We are indeed in the company of one of the greatest designers of the last century, and this one, Dame Vivian Westwood, born in England, is to me one of the most illuminating, electrifying, and original thinkers, not only in the realm of luxurious fashion, beauty, sex, and politics, but the human condition and the future of the human condition in the world. She has in her career been the Reverend Mother of Punk with her work at World's Inn and with Malcolm McLaren in the 70s. And she has influenced the world of high fashion in Paris with her extraordinary, beautiful, and thought-provoking essays in fabric in the world of high couture. She invented the mini crin, which became the poof, and her beautiful Fellini-esque body enhancements 
are extraordinary and very, very, very important in the history of contemporary fashion. I don't need to go into a great biographical rundown of who this wonderful visionary genius is. She has maintained and maintained the respect of her peers throughout her career as a fashion designer. She has always kept her pulse on her business so that her Westwood brand reaches out globally to many citizens of the planet. In 1992, she became Dame Westwood, knighted by Queen Elizabeth II, and was photographed outside of Buckingham Palace in a perfectly impeccable gray suit with a big pleated skirt and the wind capturing the ample pleats, exposing the provocateur with no undergarments. <laughs> Supermodels like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and Christy Turlington have walked in some of her most memorable Paris couture shows. Naomi Campbell has also been seen around the world virally when she fell on a pair of her extraordinary platform shoes, which are in the exhibit that will be open to SCAD in the world tomorrow. To her credit, Dame Westwood can take fabric and spin magic, a magic that lures the eye to many inventive folds and suggestions of erotica, and at the same time, create perfectly respectable, appropriate clothes for the boardroom to the ballroom. I have so much respect for this powerhouse, Vivian Westwood, who started her early life teaching and studying the art of silver making before she found her true calling. She is an oracle, often participating in activist causes for the advancement of all people. She loves to provoke, provoke not only with her cloth, scissors, and seams, she writes and thinks like a great academician, leaning on her own self-exploration of the classics and classic literature. A mother, a wife to Andreas Kornthaler, a designer, a self-made scholar, Vivian is one of the most noble minds and personalities I've ever had the pleasure to experience. I am indeed so proud, proud to be here today and to have Vivian come all the way to, from England to be part of this celebration of her great journey in life. It is indeed an honor and a great privilege to be at this moment in this wonderful, wonderful place called SCAD, founded by Paula Wallace and her family, and to present this award on behalf of SCAD named after me to a person, Vivian Westwood, who is indeed a true force of wonder. Ladies and gentlemen, President Paula Wallace and Vivian, Dame Vivian Westwood. Westwood, she did it. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the 2015 Andre Leon Talley Lifetime Achievement Award in Fashion, Dame Vivian Westwood. Yes, uh, good evening. I'm just, discover, I'm just discovering what 
Paul has been doing. And um, it's very, very impressive. And the people who live here must be extremely impressed, having known what she's been doing all these years. And Andre, she's very clever to get Andre involved uh, because Andre has an amazing reputation. And I know him. I like him very, very much. And he's come to probably all of my fashion shows. He's certainly somebody you couldn't miss with his very big body and, <laughs> and incredible charisma and personality. And fashion is here to help. But Andre, his own personal style is not fashion. He's a sort of fashion individual. And um, he does his own thing. But he is a guru of fashion. His opinion is a, a dictum for many people. And so, um, just quickly, I, um, as I would, I would like to say again, what a great companion he is, and how what a big personality he is, and charismatic. You just really want him to keep on going and talking to you and being himself. He's very dramatic, and um, so. Uh, yes, as I said, his, his word is a kind of dictum. He's, he has definitely caught, you know, what's been happening through the years and influenced it a lot himself. And so, knowing nothing about Savannah and the fashion school, I came here because his wish was my command. Okay. <laughs> Um, anyway, so thank you very much. And when I got here, I found that I was going to be honoured with this award, which I thank you all very much for. Now then, is that better? Oh dear. I should have... Uh, okay, now then, when I began as a fashion designer, I, I, well, I began not as a fashion designer. I began as a punk and the whole idea was that the world was so mismanaged and terrible that somehow young people would not accept this and we were going to do something about it. And we didn't get very far, but we did try a little bit, some of us. Anyway, and recently I became an activist Sort of with a with a vengeance. I was so traumatized a few years ago to hear um, a very famous scientist, James Lovelock, say that he thought by the end of this century there would only be one billion people left. That just really scared me. It's not possible to imagine what we're dealing with here. The thing is, most people don't fear this because they don't know. And we have got some leaflets and we don't have enough for everybody, but we've got them. And you can find out about what I'm going to say because I've got a blog and it's called Climate Revolution. But what is in this leaflet is something I wrote and I think it's the most important thing I could say because I'm using my fashion all the time to open my mouth and say what I think. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to tell you also um, terrible news. But the front of this leaflet is a map of the world. And it, if you draw a line parallel to Paris, this is what we're talking about because if the world gets two degrees hotter than it did in 1800 before the Industrial Revolution, if it gets two degrees hotter, it goes to five. You cannot stop it because all the methane starts reacting and everything kicks in. And so the scientists' models show us that it will stop at five. And if you draw a line parallel to Paris at that point, Below that line, it is uninhabitable. There's only that much earth left. 
and we could be at two degrees already, but we're very near if we haven't already passed it. We're not doing anything about it, which means that within one... We, the only thing the scientists don't know is how long it can take, but once it's in the pipeline, it will happen. And so it could happen in a generation. Anyway, I'm going to stop at that point and just say that the reason for this is also in this pamphlet, because I've just put down in a series of bullet points how it happened. It happened because of the dreadful financial system, because capitalism has turned into monopoly capitalism. And so at the, at the faceless evil at the back of this are the private banks, the central banks, the Fed is one. And what they do, they print money, but they only print money in an emergency because what happens is that they live off the interest. And the interest is so much that they've got more money than they can know what to do with. And so this money, this is what has been raping the earth because capitalism is a war economy and it depends on fossil fuel. And that's what we've been doing. And it's, it's, you know, we're going to, this is going to happen if we don't do something. Now then, um, the thing is that people don't know, it really, because it's being kept from us. And so the, the people in this triad are the faceless evil, this bank. Because what they do is they live off the interest. They do not want the principal paid back. We've all got an idea of how, how this is. It happens to individuals, as in that subprime mortgage scandal. But it, all, it happens to whole countries. We've all heard of third world countries who have been told to borrow money, made to borrow money, and then they just have to pay back the interest uh, and uh, by selling off all their assets. When they need water, they have to send lettuce. Whatever it is, the, we know this story and this is what's happening. And by this means, the central banks come to own the earth. That is the aim of it. It's so simple, so terrible. And involved in this are the monopolies, the giant monopolies, who do this trashing of the planet, and they are the politicians who support them. And now the politicians have become so confident that their propaganda can just allow them to do whatever they want, that we will believe them, that they have shown their hand and they really quite clear that every time they go for profit, and so it's profit against people because this system causes poverty, it causes the total destruction of the earth. And so <laughs> you're not being told that and this is what I have the privilege of being able to say because it's, it's the truth. And the other thing in this, it's like Mephistopheles, the press, they are the joker, the entertainer, the distractor and they serve the agents who do all this and they don't tell us. And so, um, you know, the politicians, everything they do is a crime against humanity. You are humanity. What are you going to do? I, I think it's very difficult to answer that. I don't even have the time, but you've got to get engaged in things. Just switch the lights off. Just don't drink tap water, don't drink out of a plastic bottle every now and again. Anything you can do because it will change your values. You've got to get engaged with the world and you've got to start informing yourself and following these things. And luckily, you can do this on the internet, on the social media. And of all the hopes that I have, there are thousands of wonderful NGOs doing things. And maybe democracy hasn't worked yet, but th it's the tyranny of the majority and propaganda means that people don't think the voting system is something you can hardly deal with because 
they're all the same. All politicians are criminals. Uh, maybe there's one or two who aren't. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and so the end of the story, really, um, hopefully, the social media will be a challenge to governments and, and will people will become informed enough to somehow or other s overcome. We don't know how, but I'd, sorry if I just leave it there because I don't have time. I could work it out, but I think if we start calling the politicians criminals, it might get through to a few more people and we might change public <laughs> opinion. So, um, thank you very much, and um, I would be prepared to talk about fashion after this. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, Josh. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening again, and welcome to Trustees Theatre, welcome to SCAD, and welcome to this wonderful opportunity to be in conversation with Vivian Westwood and Andreas Kronthaler, her collaborator, partner, and husband. This evening, we have the privilege, privilege of enjoying a moderated conversation and welcoming to the stage to conduct the conversation from New York Magazine, The Cut, Ms. Veronique Highland and Mr. Andre Leon Talley. And would you please welcome Andreas Kronthaler and Vivian Westwood. Settle in. So Vivian, um, your, you and Andreas and your team came to Savannah yesterday and I was told this morning pleasantly that before y'all went to bed last night you all went around the entire residence of Magnolia Hall turning off all the excess electricity. Tell us why. Oh, because uh, you just don't know. You just, you know, I can't save the world. Uh, I've always, but sometimes I just think that maybe it is me that's got to somehow do it. But that's ridiculous because what I always must remember is all those thousands of NGOs who are working about it and that half the work people in the world do know what's going on. And so we do have a chance. But when I just think, you know, like, the lights that you can't even turn off because the switch doesn't even switch them off and people just keep the lights on all the time. And so I, you know, it makes me just despair, really. Really? <laughs> and tell us also... Can you, can you imagine in what kind of house I live, by the way? <laughs> Is it dark, mostly? Pitch black. No. Pitch? Notice pitch. No, no, no. No, but I, Get I the keep right I, she switches it off and I keep switching it on, so. And also, um, I notice uh, that you don't look at television, nor did you ever, because in your biography, I don't think you've ever seen a television. Do you not read the newspapers? I watch the Twin Towers come down. Oh, yeah. yes, okay. um, Andreas has got a television at the top of the house. Yes. And, um, so he called me up to watch that, and I also watched Michael Jackson um, when he was being interviewed by that man who rather betrayed him. I yes, don't yes, know. Yes, yes, yes. And even though when I watched Michael Jackson, I know that the, the poor man was really in denial about being mm -hmm. black, mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I thought he was such a wonderful spirit. Yes. I, I really th thought he was a noble man. I, I liked him very much. Michael Jackson we're speaking yeah, about. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> and now, you were on the plane together, and you were wonderful and engaging. But at a certain point, you turned to the book, you, your plane reading, and it was, I said, well, you're reading. You said Bertram Russell. And I thought, 
well, I just have to keep talking because I've not read the book. And your standards, not only in your work, in your activism, but in your literature. What do you read? Why Bertram Russell? Why were you reading that on the plane? Um, I would love to read more novels. I think especially if there's... I, I, a great novel is wonderful. It's a vision of the world, and it, it gives you a perspective. You put yourself in other people's shoes. It's like living another life, you know, and, and I love to read novels. And um, so, but nevertheless, I've got all these other things I have to read as well to keep up with things because I'm always asking myself questions. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I stay in bed for about an hour working things out, often still lying down. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I don't mind. I'm just thinking, trying to work things out. Um, but, um, because the more you understand the world you live in, the more um, good you can do in the world, you know. And, um, but novels are the best thing. They're a vision. I, I also look at painting, and painting is um, direct experience. You don't need the words, and that is also a vision. And so I, you know, I have to find out what's happening in the world. I think great literature is a vision, and I would like to give you a definition of culture, uh, which is that it is, yeah, I, it'll take a minute, but um, it's the pursuit of our perfection. And what that means to me is, uh, that's how it begins, the definition of culture. Um, it's the pursuit of our perfection, because what that means to me is that human beings are capable of evolving into something more perfect. And what is more perfect is more human, our human genius. What we can do is to become more and more us, more and more ourselves. And if you like, it's like a concept of God. I'm not a religious believer, but I like the concept of God as something perfect that is almost, it, well, it's the same as us. We're supposed to be um, bits of God. And, and um, I, uh, we can never achieve perfection but we can go to something more perfect. And so culture is the pursuit of our perfection by means of getting to know the best that has ever been thought or said or shown in the world. And by this knowledge, casting a stream of free and fresh thought upon all our misconceptions, all our stock notions and habits, if you want to know who that was, it was Matthew Arnold who said that. Wow. But anyway. <laughs> wow. Veronique. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about sort of your origin story. And when you were starting Sorry. out. Sorry. Yeah, I want to say that we didn't have culture in the last century. We had consumption. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you came from a working class background. You didn't have connections necessarily in the industry. I, I'm wondering, what was that like? I mean, that's sort of, it's, it's not easy to, to make your way in an industry like fashion. What kind of obstacles did you face and how did you deal with them? Um, well, I, my parents were working class. My father was very entrepreneurial. He wanted to emigrate. He, always did something that, that made extra money and everything. And um, I was brought up to feel that I could do anything. And I was brought up in the north of England, and it was, I wasn't, didn't have much culture regarding my background. I didn't even go to an art gallery until I moved to London when I was 17. I didn't know they existed even. And, um, but... He, uh, he just made you feel that you could do anything. They were like that. They wanted the best for their children. That's why he moved to London. Mm -hmm. Then he said he thought it was the worst mistake he ever made. Oh. But, but um, anyway, so I, I was never brought up with... with um, and I was clever as a child and always appreciated somehow. So 
never, never thought about that at all. Um, yeah, I expect I it may, meant that I was down to, down to earth. And I began fashion not because I wanted to be a fashion designer. I actually left school early and because jobs were very easy to get then. And then I realized, no, I wanted to do more and I wanted to study. And so I was intending to go back to university, but I helped my boyfriend of the time who wanted to do this fashion. He, I, I looked up to him. He was Jewish and cosmopolitan, and he knew an awful lot more about the world than I did. And um, so we started, and um, it grew into this punk thing. And I uh, wanted to do it because I always cared, even as a child, about the suffering that happened in the world. The first I heard about that was the crucifixion. And it just absolutely traumatized me. And I never forgot. And I always thought we have to do something. So I don't know all these things. I don't know. That's everything. Uh, you know, I, I never doubted the fact that if nobody else was going to do something, I was going to have to do it. <laughs> um, and you were a fairly late entrant into the profession because you were a school teacher before you became a designer. Um, and I think that might give, that might be welcome news to some of the students in the audience that you don't have to, you know, get into this at 21. Um, do you think there were advantages to being a late bloomer of sorts and coming into it with a bit more life experience? Mm, I've never thought about that before. Uh, I just, just, no, I don't really, I haven't thought about it's it. It's never I don't too know. late. Sorry, yeah. what do you say? Nothing, nothing ever is too late, I mean. No, of course it's not, no, no. And it's, it, it, design and fashion, you know, it's something to do with experience and life as well. And when you have or had this before, it will show in, in what you do. Uh, it, it could be very positive to start late. <laughs> I knew it was totally accidental. I didn't do it by choice. I just did it to help somebody because I could could make things. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious about, since you're so strongly associated with punk, you're synonymous with punk, what, what did that movement mean to you as it was unfolding? And how do you kind of carry that on now in your activism, in your design, in, in your life? Well, um, I was doing what then, when I look back on it, what I'm doing now, which is I was trying to change public opinion. And the punks weren't really that interested in how people, other people were suffering and what a dreadful world it was. They just wanted a good time. And so I, I've mentioned it before, it's like you feel somewhere we, we are going to do, I invented the anarchy sign, I thought, we don't need those people. But I didn't really have any troops going into battle. Not even Malcolm, because Malcolm had other reasons for doing things. Um, he just hated anybody who was in authority or, or grown up. Uh, but anyway, and he treated me a bit like that because I was four years older than him. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, what, what, have I, have so I you were saying the punk, question? punk wasn't like an inherently political movement. That was something that you brought to it. You had these political... No, sorry, we invented it. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't bring anything to it. We just invented this idea. We uh, closed our shop, and then when we reopened it, um, we uh, already the Sex Pistols had been playing because mm -hmm. one of them was a customer of mine and whatever. And one yeah. of them was my Saturday shop assistant. And um, and um, so we o we opened our shop with these clothes, and already this band was playing, and they were doing their own songs and everything, and um, yeah. I, I have a question for Andreas. Andreas, how did you and Vivian meet? Give us, tell us about that. How you all first met and fell in love. Um, we met. Uh, Vivian, she was my teacher. We met in Vienna uh, more than 25 years ago. 
88 or 89. She was giving classes in Vienna at an yeah, art school or fashion on, on school? The Ac Academy of Applied Art. Uh -huh. And I was a student there. And um, yeah, I met her there. I didn't really know very much of her before. I didn't really know her story. I saw a couple of things she did, and I really liked them and stuff. But I remember the first time she came into the classroom, or room, you can say. I was sitting high up on a window sill, so I could see and hear everything properly. And uh, she came in, and I just thought, my god, I'd, I've never seen anything like it. She looked incredible. What incredible. was she wearing? She was wearing a, she was wearing a kilt, a Scottish kilt, and some leggings, wool leggings, with um, um, with argyle. a matching yeah argyle, argyle leggings with a matching twin set, and she had a little, she had a big magnifying glass, and she had a little bag made out of wooden beads. And I just thought her so eccentric and so incredible with this orange hair in big curls. And, and anyway, and as soon as she started to speak, I was um, smitten. I was mesmerized. I just, you know this thing when you meet somebody and he suddenly speaks or he, he can articulate all these things you are always thought or had in you. Uh, Suddenly, it's like opening a window of, I don't know. It was like that. And what were you wearing that particular day when you were smitten and suddenly realized <laughs> that this was the woman, the lady of your life, your future? I were you in Lederhosen or Austrian, mm -hmm. Austrian Lederhosen, biker clothes, punk? I was always in gray in those days, didn't I? In gray what? And dress, it took gray flannel and... and, and, and I always had grey stuff on, grey flannel and grey, grey melange. I don't know, and you used to wear wigs and hats and things. Oh, see, <laughs> wigs, what kind of wigs? It's true, it's true. Uh, Mozartian wigs, Mozart, 18th century? No, what it was, as heads, they were like heads, uh. they blonked down on the side a little, yeah. like a, ba a beret. I don't know, I oh. don't, don't ask me. <laughs> Uh, it made sense then. Okay, back to Vivian. You, 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 you said at the end um, that the last century was not a century of culture, a century of consumption. And one of the great novels on your reading list, which we will pass out to people, we've printed it out your reading list that you gave to us, was the extraordinary masterpiece of Gustave Flaubert, Madame Bovary, which is a really essentially a novel about a woman who's addicted to consumption that it causes her ruin. She eventually takes her life by eating rat poison. Uh, that is a masterpiece world of writing and the vision of that world. What are some of your other favorite novels that inspire you when you want to escape into that world of perfection in terms of writing and literature? Other novels? Sorry, what other novels for what? Do you love, that yeah. when you, for that ah. sense of perfection in okay. terms of writing and literature? Yeah. Well, there's an they're all so different one from another, aren't they? Yes. Uh, but the two greatest novels of the 20th century in English are, of course, 1984, George Orwell, yes. and also Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, written in 1930, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And um, they are both a view of society as a dystopia, but they are, they're a kind of satire on the world that was in existence, even in 1930, um, Huxley could see what was mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. um, f w they're very, very different. Orwell's book is, it was described as a boot in the face forever. It's really violent and cold and based on the communist system also. Um, but and at Huxley's is more subtle. It is the, the world controller. Everybody is programmed to want only what they can get. And they're all programmed to a certain level so that the Ypsilon character is happy just going up and down in the lift all the time. It's funny because television was just about invented then. 
but Huxley didn't somehow need to mention it. He did mention sleep teaching, which never really was true, but it seemed like it might have been at the time. But anyway, um, it, it's um, the well controller really just said, you know, we don't, um, these aren't his exact words, but what he's getting at is that we make, we don't let people do what they like, kind of, it's that we make people mm, like what they do. We don't, people don't do what they like, but they like what they do. And um, so that is our world. That is the effect of the propaganda to the lucky people in the world. I guess the unlucky ones don't feel quite the same about it, but yeah. Mm. Do you think that in the world that you live in, in your, your daily world in England, not just going to work uh, in the world of fashion, but in your activism, that there's enough being done about the world? Do you think there are, there's enough people who are really concerned as you are about sustainability and making those efforts like you did to turn the lights out, um, uh -huh. to go around turning on all the lights, pulling on all the plugs, which saves energy. Do you think England is at the forefront of this kind of movement? Um, I would like to answer that, but can I just say that, um, you know, the novels I read are very, very different. A brilliant model to read is this sort of rather Faustian thing of, the um, Master and Margarita, for example, is a fantastic book. John Steinbeck is a powerful writer, a great, great writer. So is Cormac McCarthy, you know. I mean, you've got some wonderful writers. They're all brilliant to read. And um, anyway, so, uh, yeah. So now then, England. Um, to, I, I, as I said, it is my great hope there are absolutely wonderful people. I am a friend of Julian Assange. That man is trapped at the moment. The frame that traps him is that the American government want him in concrete. He's their most wanted man uh, because he's the one who really has challenged them and so far has escaped, um, has escaped them. And, and um, he is such a noble character, and what he's done is great. And so I love to go and talk to him and pick his brains because I don't know anybody who knows as much as what's happening in the world as he does. He really does know. Anyway, but I did mention the thousands of NGOs. There are amazing people who do things, people who just go in and do things hands-on that I would never dream of doing. I've got a friend who just decided to go to Poland. I don't know, she must have had to set this up. And she made this film all undercover about these poor little pigs who are just all going mental and so frightened and so abused. And the great ponds of the shit and slurry that comes out. I don't know, and I just can't imagine doing something like that. People, there are great, great people doing all kinds of things. I know a, a man, an ex-boyfriend of Pamela Anderson. Pamela's great. She does such a lot. And her ex-boyfriend, he just had, he was a surfer, and he just had a little kit of a bucket that cost $50 and a pipe or something. And you went, he went into communities. He was lucky enough to be there at the tsunami in, when it happened in Bali. And he went in there with his plastic buckets and his little kit and, set, and, and fresh water for like 100 people for ages. And he must have saved a lot of lives, particularly, apparently, for them to wash the wounds of people. There were just incredible people doing things. And um, yeah, and it's building. And Bill McKibben is in amazing from 350.org. That man has been to every country in the world except North Korea. And in every country, there is an enclave of activists who we can just call upon to just simultaneously protest against the abuses by this minority to the whole planet and everybody in it. And so the idea would be that some, we're all trying, climate revolution, my, my one, is very much about connecting with these people and working together as well. So, I mean, they, 
you know, there's so many people just doing one little thing, just go to your school and just do this little thing and things, and then people start coming to you and, and everybody can connect in the end. Everything's connected. Yeah. Mm. Um, we spoke a little bit this morning. I know one issue that's so important to you is consumption, raising awareness about, you know, the wastefulness of all this consumption that's going on, especially in this world of fast fashion. Um, and you were talking about your motto, buy less, buy better quality. Yes. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, how you, obviously you're a designer, you're putting out clothing, but you're reconciling that with, you know, this awareness about consumption and you don't want people to buy, buy, buy. Mm -hmm. um, you want people to be judicious. So can you, can you talk a little bit about yeah. that balance? First of all, I want to say that a green economy <clears throat> is not just about green jobs. It's about having more school teachers. It's about all kinds of things, different values, and, e and a hierarchy of values where we value things in relation to their true value. You know, artists or um, people, <coughs> people who clean, um, you know, intellectuals, all kinds of things that, anyway, education. Uh, they, they, I mean, Tony Blair, when he got in, education, he said, education, 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 the more that you learn, the more you earn. Is that what education is? You know, I mean, we, they don't have the right values today at all. And so a green economy is an economy that can manage to have a wonderful world. Wait a minute, <clears throat> because the way to do that is just a guide, but you just follow it, uh, the rule of thumb. What's good for the planet is good for the economy. What's good for the economy is good for the planet, and it's good for people. All of that, we have to live in relation to the earth. And so my job, First of all, I keep the job. I haven't given it up. I've got quite a lot of people working this job, uh, don't we, Andres? But um, I, I don't give it up because, number one, it gives me a chance to open my mouth like I am doing <laughs> now. And, and um, the other thing is that I think it's a very good business. And it's, for example, it doesn't, um, it's labor extensive. It's there. Are, it needs a lot of skill, and so you're you you know. So the the jobs and the and the energy that go into it is something that is of value that somehow doesn't wreck the earth. Not really. It, and so the amount of wrecking isn't as much as if you're just like a production line producing lots of rubbish. And the design quality is very important. So. Our motto is quality, not quantity. And right from the beginning, the Andres and I own this company. And I've never been really profit-led. My only criterion was I had to like the clothes. And then if the people bought them, then that's why I continued. Anyway, but um, so our main motto is buy less, choose well, make it last. We're trying to actually reduce the size of our company, not so much reduce the size of it as we've got too much product. I'm trying to squeeze it down and actually have less. And um, anyway, and so I don't, I don't need to do it if I don't like it, you know, that's the reason to do it. If, if I, the only reason to do it is to sell beautiful clothes and, and to give people, I think, a choice. Now, I think, I think it's a very nice business. I think it's a business that could flourish in a green economy. But of course, you know, I, I don't pretend that this is some holy thing. I know that there is a big carbon footprint, but for the time being, I continue because I think it's quite a good business. Yeah. One last question from Veronique. Andreas, because you have Oh, Andre oh Andreas, last question, Veronique. To okay, um, well, this is for both of you. Um, I always love to ask designers what they're inspired by now, what they're thinking about 
now. And I, looking through your archive, you've done collections inspired by pirates, witches, Clint Eastwood westerns, Petrushka, the ballet, the time machine. Um, so I'm curious what you're both, you know, finding inspiring right this very second. What are you thinking about? What are you, you know, jazzed about? Um, we, last collection we, in Paris, we called it unisex. Um, it's, it's, it's about clothes. I mean, it's not a particular new idea. We know that um, girls look great in, in men's clothes and but it's the other way around, which is more difficult. Look, boys good in girls' clothes. And um, well, we have done a few dresses last season, which actually work, which work as well on a boy as on a girl. And they really do, actually. And um, it, it, I, I thought it, w it would have been more easier, but it wasn't. It was quite a lot of work in the end. I thought you just have to grade something up, you know. Do you have a because I started off with having a, um, the idea was just to have a, 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 a girl's dress and then you grade it up to the size so a man can fit in. But you have to change proportions, you have to keep making twirls, you know, trying. And, um, but it was interesting and I, I think we're continuing on, on that again. That's such a, a thread in fashion now, but I know you were on the vanguard of that. You've been doing unisex designs for a long time. For um, years, yeah, yeah, now, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a way of, of um, helping the environment and not needing to buy so many clothes if you <laughs> share them anyway, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> and and I, I love the look of a, wo of a woman wearing her old man's jacket. I think it's great, yeah. Danny, do we have time for questions from the, from the audience? Yes? Do we have time for questions from the yes. audience? Do. We do have time for just uh, one, honestly, just one or two questions uh, from the audience. If you will raise your hand, I'll come to you. Um, oh, you're making it tough for me. <laughs> the lady with the head. <laughs> I think I'll start right here. Would you please stand uh, right here down in front on your right? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tyrant. Um, Vivian Westwood, I'm a sophomore uh, here at SCAD, and I've been following your work ever since I was in 10th grade. And I was just wondering, um, well, first, I love you. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, most That's of my fantastic. idols. fantastic, thanks ever so much, that's lovely. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, all, most of my idols are long gone, so I said if I ever get to meet one, I will ask this question, but if you ever need an intern, I would love to work for you, and you can, you can count on me. You can come tomorrow. I'll be there. Thank seriously, you. Seriously, seriously. Be, I'll be there. Yeah. I, I promise. S Give me See your... Andreas tomorrow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a talk to him, are, yeah. Are you in SCAD? Give, give me your contact, I'll take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> we'll give you a, we'll give you a and uh, and that's how we do it at SCAD. No opportunity goes unseized. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry. That's all the time we have this evening. Would you please join me again in thanking Veronique Hyland, Andre Leon Talley, Andreas Kronthaler, and Vivian Westwood. Thank you very much.